Thanks, everyone. So our next speaker is Dr. John Roach. He's um, going to be speaking about future innovations in the primary sector. So John was appointed Chief, Chi Chief Science Advisor in June 2018 to provide an independent science perspective to the Ministry for Primary Industries. And he's just told me he's been uh, recently appointed Director On-Farm Support Services as well, and he's got his new team coming together at, at uh, MPI straight after this, so he'll be having to race away, unfortunately. But um, we really appreciate you being here, John. So John leads the Prime Minister's um, Chief Science Ad Advisor Science Forum. It chairs the Science Governance Group at MPI and the Independent Mycoplasma Bovis Strategic Science Advisory Group. John is also an adjunct professor at the University of Auckland School of Biological Science. He was previously Dairy NZ's principal science, scientist for animal science. He is also managing partner of Down to Earth Advice Limited. So John has an honours degree in agricultural science, a master's in farm systems and pasture management, and a PhD in animal nutrition. So welcome, John. Thanks, Dougal. Uh, kia ora tato. Tanakoto, kote kai toho to a matanga puta matua, kite manatu aha matua, ko crocon toka manga, ko main toka awa, ko Norman, ko Celt, ko Irish oko iwi, ko County Kerry toko hapu, ko John Roach toko ingawa. Dear Yiva Korija, is as Aaron me, is as Kunti Kiri, Krina here in me, Sean the Roach de Sanam Dum. So it's great to be here this morning. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Matt, for the invitation. Um, yes, uh, for my sins, the Director General met with me about eight weeks ago, and he said, you know the half an hour spare you have on a Friday afternoon? Would you mind taking on the establishment director of on-farm support services? So I, I, I should have told him I was busy, but anyway. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, as Dougal said, uh, we've got, by, by the end of this year, we hope to have a footprint of about 40, 45 people out there in the regions interacting with a lot of you guys, so hopefully get to talk to you about that as well. Um, and we've got about half of them in Wellington today and this week for an induction. But anyway, without further ado, future innovations in the primary sector. Emerson said that the first farmer was the first man and all historic nobility rests on the possession and use of land. A lot of anthropologists will disagree with me, but I've got the microphone so they can disagree with me. Um, farming is the foundation of civilization. If we th think back to 12,000 years ago when the first men and women decided that they could scratch the ground and drop grass seeds into it and stabilize their community in situ, it was at that point that we were able to build a civilization that we've all got to know and love. Yes, I know people were drawing pictures on, on caves 20,000 years before that, but there was no artists. This is what allowed us to produce artists. And nothing has changed in time. If you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, whether it's ending hunger and poverty or it's in improving our footprint from an environmental point of view, the primary sector is inherently linked to at least half of the Sustainable Development Goals. And it's important because humanity is facing, quite arguably, the existential crisis that Robert Malthus talked about 220 years ago. This is the amount of calories that the world has had to produce to feed our population since the year zero. And to put that in perspective, what it means is that we have to produce as much protein in the next 30 years as a world as we did in the last 2,000 years. And we've no more land. For the first time in human history, we've no more land. In fact, I think everyone in this room would recognize that we're probably using land we shouldn't be using. And some of that has to be returned to nature for the good of the planet and the survival of our species. And it doesn't matter whether you look at it from a, from a land use or a chemical use or any of the other planetary boundaries. In a lot of the developed world, we have transgressed those boundaries. Many of you will have seen the, the picture on the right before, I'm sure. It's from the US Geological Survey. And it, it puts into perspective the amount of water that we have on the planet. So the big bubble here is the, amount, the total amount of water that we have in the world. Salt water, fresh water, the water in the atmosphere, the water in our bodies, that's the estimated total water on a scale to the size of the planet. The next water 
That's the amount of fresh water that's on the planet. 1% of the total water is the amount of fresh water that's on the planet. But again, as many of you will know better than me, we don't have access to 99% of that. This is the amount of water that we actually, fresh water that we have access to relative to the size of the world. It's a resource that many people don't understand how precious it is. And as Ben Franklin said, we'll only know the value of it when it's gone. And we're failing. For the first time in 25 years, our world hunger statistics are going up. They were going up before COVID, by the way. COVID has accentuated it. So we're now not feeding as many people as we were feeding. And of course, we're dealing with a world that's trying to stop us producing food as well. Many of it, much of it our own fault, I know. So scientists often turn to Einstein when this particular quote, when we're talking about solving problems, you know, we can't solve the problems of today with the same logic that, that we used to create it. I don't go to Einstein, I tend to go to George Bernard Shaw. As an Irishman, I would, wouldn't I? That the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress de depends on the unreasonable man. And I, I know that wasn't meant to be gender specific, but I've also known that there's no such thing as an unreasonable woman. So it, it probably... <laughs> so for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm, um, I'm going to try and be reasonably unreasonable. Or maybe it's unreasonably reasonable. You, you can tell me afterwards. So what is innovation? Let's think, talk about that first. Because when people think of innovation, they think of things like this. Vertical farming, culturing um, bacteria, um, virtual fencing, robots spraying or, or, or weeding um, uh, cereal fields, things like that, or picking fruit, etc. cetera. Um, I, I have an iPhone. That's as technically savvy as I get, and I can only use a fraction of the things that the iPhone can do. So I went back to see, what does innovate mean? And the root of the word innovate is from the Latin novus, new. And when I went to the dictionaries to see what did innovate mean, it was all about making changes, trying something new, doing something in a new way. There's no technology in there. So I'm going to move away from technology. So if any of you thought I was going to talk about technologies, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to disappoint you. I'll do my best to answer them any questions at the end, though. All right, so let's talk about innovation and doing things new. So this is the, the history of our, of, of our world over the last 20,000 years. So the for first half of that, we were hunter-gatherers. We lived fairly close to the equator because it wasn't really hospitable that far north of there. Um, and sometime around 12,000 years ago, as I said, men and women started scratching the ground in, in the Levant. And lo and behold, we were able to grow small grain grasses and stabilize uh, the, the population. And then for 2,000 years, we've seen this massive spread of innovations right through to the whole 4,000 years ago, the plow 3,000 years, years ago. ago. Now, most people went to school. They, they, they think of innovation as being the recent agricultural revolution of the 18th and 19th century. Uh, sorry, the 18th and 19th century, yeah. Um, and those that didn't actually learn about the agricultural revolution think about innovation as everything we've done in the last 60 years. Um, despite the vast majority of what we've done before that. There's good reason for that. When you think about what we've done in the last 60 years, these are long-term cereal yields at the Rothamsted Experimental Station in the UK from the mid-1800s through to now. And, and you can see that it was around 1960 where we started to control weeds, rusts, other things like that. Um, and, and, of course, the significant breeding uh, improvements that had occurred through the Green Revolution, where we managed to produce a lot more cereal from the same amount of land. In fact, that's obviously in a research station. This is uh, our world in data's um, estimate of, uh, at the world. And basically, we're producing three times as much cereal from the same amount of land now than we were 60 years ago. So, so it's, it's easy, easy to, to see, see why, why people think of that as being the period of evolution. Same thing with animals. We're producing 50% more meat per carcass. These, this is US data um, than we were back in the 1970s. And likewise, we're producing three times the amount of milk per cow in the United States uh, than we were back in the, at the end of World War II. We don't have to go overseas. We can see it here in New Zealand. This is the New Zealand dairy industry. Um, and we've got about 10% improvements in productivity, biological pro productivity, as at, at the cow level. The amount of feed to produce a kilo of milk solids has been dropping dramatically through time. And as a result of that, we're producing milk with a far lower carbon footprint per liter of milk 
than we were back in those days. We're, we, we've got 30% uh, more milk for the same ton of carbon dioxide as we had in 1990. And of course, food affordability has gone with that. If you look back prior to 1960, food, the price of food was actually trending upwards, but it was all over the place. It was just, it was, it was expensive. And since we've made those innovative uh, improvements in the primary sector globally, we've seen this massive drop in the price of food. Now there's times, as in the oil crisis of the 1970s, and again, post GFC, we see these spikes in food production, uh, food prices, and we're seeing it again now, but the historical trend has still been the same. And the same for animal production, so. But, and there's always a but, having complimented every, everything, everything you say before, the but of course is forgotten about. There's been a, a very heavy use of resources, and Im fairly significant implications for the environment as a result. Again, our world in data, uh, um, data showing uh, massive overuse of nitrogen fertilizer in many parts of the world and massi massive overuse of phosphorus in many parts of the world. And again, we don't have to go outside our own boundaries to see the footprints that have uh, um, increased I over that time period that I'm talking about. So the dairy industry has doubled since 1990 and its greenhouse gas footprint has gone up equivalently. And of course, we've seen um, an, uh, our waterways in many catchments diminish in quality, um, strong correlation between lowland waterways and those statistics, uh, intensively managed grassland where we have dairy cows. Now that's not meant to be a beat up on dairy farming, uh, but dairying is a big part of our primary sector and therefore has a big footprint um, in our environment as well. So, what many people have called progress is literally exchanging one nuisance for another. So we left famine and starvation behind us, but we put ourselves now in a place where our natural resources are massively under stress and we need to think about what comes next. All right. So, innovation. I decided I'd go to probably two of the most famous, at least, if not the greatest innovators of, of our generation, and that is Steve Jobs and Jeff Bo Bezos. And their definition, Steve Jobs, innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity rather than as a threat. I'll come back to that soon. I want to start with Jeff Bezos's uh, quote here, which is, we innovate by starting with what the customer wants and then working backwards. So, what does the customer want? Well, if you believe the newspapers, the customers want meatless meat, chickenless chicken, milkless milk. Uh, they want fake foods. We're, we're, we are being told that continually, and it would be fairly easy to believe that if that was all you read. But let's take a look at the statistics. So from the Euro Monitor, this is the growth in, in dairy, all dairy, not just milk, dairy, um, and the forecasted growth in for the next five years relative to the dairy alternatives, the soy, the oat, the uh, almond juices, all of those. And so although they're growing at the same rate, approximately, dairy is growing from a far greater base. And so if you were to look at those statistics, you would say that the future of dairy is secure from an economic perspective, from a demand perspective, let me put it that way. Um, but the future of dairy alternatives is, is pretty secure as well. And go back to that third slide I showed you. We need to produce as much protein in the next 30 years as we did in the last 2,000 years. We will need to produce all the protein we can. This is not an either or, it is and, and, and. It's the same for red meat. Um, the meat alternatives are growing, there's no question about that, but so is red meat. It's growing at a, at a phenomenal rate as the population grows, as the population grows in wealth and demands more animal protein, we are seeing uh, an increase in the demand. One of the places where uh, you, you can't hide the facts is in the stock market. So what does the stock market say about these alternatives? So we have seen as much investment in one single year, 2020 is the statistic that I have, in one single year, sorry, 50% of the investment in one single year compared with the 40 years beforehand. Now I've said that really badly. The amount of money that was invested over 40 years in those alternative products, half of that amount was put into investment in those products in one single year in 2020. So people are backing the production of alternatives to our traditional foods, no question about it. But this is what the stock market says. 
So if you wanted, you could have bought shares in Beyond Meat 18 months ago for $120 a share. You can pick them, up, pick them up now for about $30 a share. Now, I'm comparing the blue line at the top is the Dow Jones. Uh, the dark blue line coming down is Beyond Meat. The yellow line is Oatly. That is how, how their shares have performed over the last 15 to 16 months. I'm not comparing like with like. I could be criticized for that because the Dow Jones obviously is made up of an awful lot of tech companies. So look at Fonterra and Sinley and Kerry Group. So three food ingredients companies at the top. They have dropped by between 5 and 10%, just like the Dow Jones has over that period of time, um, but nothing compared to the fake meat and fake milk uh, companies. So what is the consumer saying to us? Well, I believe that the consumer is saying we want natural, but we want it to be sustainable. And, and that's why MPI's vision is that New Zealand will be the most sustainable provider of high-value food, food and, and prim primary products. So change is an opportunity. Back to Steve Jobs. And this is a place where I've, I've torn my head out, to uh, hair out, torn my head off. I've torn my hair out, obviously, talking to, um, talking to people about a particular subject. <clears throat> and I'll come back to that subject in a second. Because change doesn't mean that you need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The problem with change is that the only person that likes change is a wet baby. Humans have an aversion to change as a general rule. Gilbert Anoka summed it up, I, I think summed it up really well. I listened to him a couple of months ago in a presentation that he gave, and I took this slide away from him, and it was, elite athletes preserve the core and disrupt the edges. So, and I know it's ironic, uh, an Irishman talking about one of the all black coaches in a really positive way, but anyway, I, I think Gilbert Anoka's loyalty to this has stood the, the All Blacks in good stead over the last several months where the vast majority of people were looking to throw out the players and the coaching team after Ireland's uh, win just down the road here. Um, and they've turned it around by disrupting the edges. The All Blacks didn't go from being the world's best team to being the world's worst team in the space of three games. And they've proved it again. Preserve the core, disrupt the edges. So, future of food. I so thought I'd bring this in. And note the stress, my opinion. Not a ministry position, my opinion. There's, there's one, one tranche is going to be commodities. High volume, good nutrition, low cost, low returns, generally speaking. It is, it is a margin game. New foods. Um, these are the alternatives that we just talked about. They will be successful. There's no doubt about it. We need the protein. They have to be successful. There'll be molecular, uh, laboratory-produced foods, fermented foods, insect-based proteins. All of these will have a place in the future. They probably, in early on, will have a niche consumer base, those that have an objection to some of the things that happen up here, or just, just people that actually they're not that bad for them. Questionable nutrition, that will depend on which of these foods that you're talking about. Some of them are incredibly highly processed, and their nutrition should be questioned. But let's face it, if we can get the cost down, they'll be commoditized. They will just be the next branch of commodities. Um, and therefore, they need to be low cost to compete, and they will be low returns. And I think the third branch of the future of food is what we term modern regenerative foods. They're natural. They're what the consumer has told us that they want. They've got a low environmental footprint that's absolutely necessary if we're going to farm them into the future. They're going to have good nutrition, and they're going to taste great, and they're going to have strong animal welfare credentials. And for me, this is where New Zealand has carved out a niche that it can preserve the core and disrupt the edges. Let me finalize on that. So that's what we've come to with Fit for a Better World. So this is the, the economic recovery, post-COVID economic recovery plan for the country where we will improve productivity over the next decade by 44 billion beyond what would have happened anyway. We will reduce our greenhouse gas footprints in, in uh, line with what we've, uh, we have um, committed to, and we will, we will improve our fresh water quality, and we will increase the number of New Zealanders that are engaged and working in the primary sector. In other words, we're going to find the correct balance between economic growth and environmental sustainability. I think we all acknowledge that the country has gone through a fantastic period of economic growth, but it has been at the consequence, to a degree at least, of our environmental standards. We need to rectify that. We need to rebalance that. And we're calling that regenerative agriculture. 
And that is where I've been pulling my hair out. Because it doesn't matter in which audience I stand, some people think I've gone lunatic left, or green, sorry, not left, lunatic green, and others think I'm not green enough. What do we mean about, for, uh, what does regenerative agriculture mean for New Zealand? Because this is where it is. We had a technical advisory group come together, we talked about this quite a lot. Uh, we then had a hui that some of you will have been at, um, about 150 people came together to talk about this. And we came, and it was, it was, um, I'm almost finished, Dougal. Uh, it, was, it was talked about at that hui that we shouldn't talk about regenerative agriculture as a noun because it's a journey. It's a, it's a journey of continuous improvement and there's multiple practices that will be suitable for some landowners and won't be suitable for other landowners, won't make a difference for some, will make a huge difference for others. So we talked about the journey, regenerating Aotearoa. And anything, any practices that in isolation or collectively can Im achieve improved outcomes for our productive landscapes, rivers, coastal and marine environments, biodiversity and natural ecosystems, improve animal welfare, have potential to increase profitability and add value, promote health and well-being for humans, whilst ensuring we can grow and consume our food and fiber products sustainably, and meet the goals of Taiao, Fenua Ora, Maori Ora, and Te Ao Te Aroa. That is what we're defining as regenerating Aotearoa. And just to quickly finish off, what that means is that farmers should be recognized for the things that they're doing well. We're on this continuous improvement. Um, sorry, does someone want to take a picture of that? <laughs> Excellent. So, so what should we do? Look, uh, you, you, uh, again, I'm, I'm speaking to the converted here. I'm sure all of you have seen this paper by Rich McDowell, but it shows that with the innovations that we currently have, if they are put in place, we can reduce our nitrogen loss from land by 19% now, and by 2035, the ones that are here now and are on, in train, we can reduce our nitrogen loss from land by, by 34%. We've got a similar graph for phosphorus. I won't go into it. The paper is obviously freely available online. And, um, and so as MPI, we are, two slides, uh, as MPI, we are um, investing heavily through SFF Futures in a whole portfolio of projects across the country, horticulture, arable, uh, dairy, red meat, to see what practices will lead to those outcomes that we've got in that vision. We are an evidence-based ministry, so we're not just backing the term. We're putting our money behind it, we're putting your money behind it to actually see what practices will make a difference. So, to leave you with one final thought. If you go into your supermarket and you walk around, so I, sorry, I, I should have said, I think uh, Dougal said it anyway. I was trained as a nutritionist. And, the, and I know you wouldn't, know, you wouldn't think it to look at me. But anyway, I was trained as a nutritionist. Never, never trust a skinny cook. And um, the best piece of nutrition advice I was ever given was stick to the outside aisle of the supermarket. So you go in, you got your fresh fruit and veggies, down past your red meat and fish, down past the ice cream, uh, down past the milk, the cheeses, the processed meats, etc. And you end up in the alcohol aisle at the corner. And you've, you've got a completely balanced diet. We produce the outside aisle of the supermarket. And that is a badge of honor for the country. We do it well. We do it better than anybody else, but we have to do it better. I'm going to leave it at that. Sorry, Dougal. Ran over time.